deserve our love and attention moms and they are being treated as such here at the ballpark today huge crowd nice sunny afternoon and the Blue Jays hoping for a sweep of the Atlanta Braves here on this Mother's Day Sunday you say Kikuchi draws the assignment for the Blue Jays making his eighth start of the season and he'll take on a team very good offensive team but they have been held to just two runs in the first two games of this series both of them driven in by Marcelo Zuna who hit a two run home run yesterday he's got five home runs in his last eight games also Ozzie Albies is hitting 440 with power against left handed pitching this season and that's what he'll face this afternoon and you say Kikuchi who's making his eighth start this is the eighth time through the rotation for the Blue Jays and Kikuchi is off to a great start five and zero oh with a three thirty five earned run average Last time out in Pittsburgh, he pitched his longest outing as a Blue Jay. Went six and a third, allowed no runs on just four hits. And you see a lot of pink in the ballpark, as you will see all afternoon. In honor of Mother's Day and part of Major League Baseball's initiative to raise awareness of and funding towards breast cancer research and treatment. So whether it's uh, shin guards or bats or gloves, uh, chest protectors, you name it. Also a special note about you see the bat that Ronald Acuna Junior is using uh, a lot of baseball players using the pink bat uh, and those are available uh, for purchase Louisville Slugger has made special pink bats you can go to Slugger dot com and whoa speaking of Slugger Ronald Acuna Junior into the second deck a uh, no doubter to get it underway with a bang here for the Braves. That's the ninth home run Kikuchi has surrendered and for Acuna that's his eighth home run his 28th leadoff home run one of the best leadoff hitters in all of baseball and he put a charge in this one fastball up out over the plate and on Wednesday down in Atlanta he had a home run 470 feet. So there's a lot of power in that relatively small body but he turns this one loose and hits it into the second deck deep in left field uh, no doubter to jump start the offense so Atlanta on the board one to nothing early uh, a leadoff man with about as much power as anybody in the game at times dangerous dangerous guy here's Matt Olson and Kikuchi and Olsen are very familiar with one another from Kikuchi's days with Seattle Olsen with Oakland Olsen is five for 20 with a couple of home runs in his career against Kikuchi this is Kikuchi's first start ever against Atlanta as he gets Olsen and only two batters in the Atlanta lineup only one batter actually in the Atlanta lineup today has ever faced him and that's Olsen with Sean Murphy on the bench that four seam fastball upstairs you can see as Olsen cuts underneath it's got a lot of ride on that four seamer and that's another strikeout for Kikuchi and now here's Albies and as we mentioned off the top he is just uh, rocking left handed pitching this year 22 for 50 four doubles a triple four homers huge numbers against lefties why he's up in the three spot today. Well the Blue Jays have done a good job top of the order coming into this game they had held the top four hitters in this batting order just three for 30 in the first two games but Acuna he messed that up right out of the shoot. Atlanta comes in having lost three in a row they lost their last game in their last series against the Red Sox with the first two here obviously but still overall Brian Snitker's team is off to a great start they've won the National League East five years in a row and they certainly are off to a good start this year they're five games up on the second place Phillies right now. This is the first road series they have lost all season long they've got a terrific road record at 15 and five. Ozuna hit the two run home yesterday Acuna a solo shot to start this game. And fouled off a full count now on Albies. You know this series so far has been another reminder when you pitch well you can shut down even the best lineups and that's what's happened. These are two of the best offenses in all of baseball but the pitching has had the upper hand.
Three two. And another foul off. Eight start of the year for Yusei Kikuchi and five of the first seven have been terrific either no runs allowed or just one run allowed the walk rate is way down from last year. That's pulled foul as Albies continues to put up a good at bat. Now, Kikuchi he is very talented there's no question about that he was the first overall draft pick out of high school in Japan in 2009. And he pitched in the big leagues and. In Japan and came to Seattle with the Mariners. Swing and a miss on a fastball away. Back to back strikeouts. So last year, Kikuchi with an ERA well over five, but this year, as we mentioned, five of the seven have been really good. The exception to start against the Angels early and then a start at Fenway on the last road trip. I don't know that you can expect this every time out but if you can get this more often than not for a guy who came into the season as a bit of a wild card and quote the number five starter I mean the Blue Jays are going to be very happy with this. Yes they are and he had to win his job in the rotation I mean he finished the season last year working out of the bullpen so he pitched very well all spring long and he had to be focused because he knew what was at stake. Pitched him out of the pen at the end of the year, but he threw over 20 innings in spring training and really got ready. And I think that has a lot to do with his good start. John Schneider was asked about 10 days ago, probably, at what point of the regular season did you start believing this is who you say Kikuchi is? He said, We started believing it at the end of spring training. Like yeah. they saw enough in the spring because he was lights out in the spring. That they felt comfortable that he was a different guy coming into this year. Yeah, and they were really, really locked into his pitch sequencing. They had him throw this slider a little bit harder. Last year, the slider was 86, 87. It's been as high as 89 this year. Pete Walker and John Snyder both understand an awful lot about pitching, and his pitches were very effective all spring long. And he got him 95 inside corner. So after the Acuna home run, Three consecutive punch outs for Yusei Kikuchi. His time here in Toronto, and he is very appreciative of that. Having spoken with him yesterday, he'll get a nice big ovation when he comes up to the plate for the first time. As will Vladimir Guerrero Jr., because why wouldn't he? Look at the numbers that he is putting up. Had a good day yesterday, had a double, had a walk, had a sacrifice fly, had a great slide out at second base. The Blue Jays 11 and 3 at home on the season. They have won all five home series this year, and it's a bullpen day for Atlanta beginning with Colin McHugh. Now McHugh has been a starter in the past but recently he is pitching out of a bullpen. He last faced the Blue Jays six times in 2021 as an opener for the Tampa Bay Rays. So he has faced this lineup a lot. George Springer leads it off Springer Bichette and Guerrero the Blue Jays down one to nothing in the bottom of the first. Chop towards short and it gets under the bare hand of Arcia who had kind of a do or die play out there and Springer is aboard. Well George had a two point swing at that breaking ball and it didn't hit very hard and watch the swing step swing bouncing ball up the middle do or die play for Arcia and he can't come up with it. Couldn't find a handle on this bouncing ball his only hope was to bare hand it and he couldn't come clean with it. Good start for Springer and field hit for the Blue Jays. Well, for a guy who earlier in the year spent a couple of weeks hitting balls right at people and didn't have much to show for it, he'll take that. Here's Bo Bichette. Bo with a couple of singles and a couple of RBIs in yesterday's game. Seems like we say that every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, and a wide strike right there. It's one and one. That'll uh, go into his memory bank for the rest of the day. 
The Braves hoping McHugh can go somewhere between two plus and three innings today. They're down a couple of injured starters and Max Freed, Kyle Wright, so they are kind of mixing and matching right now. They're hoping to get Mike Soroka back soon, but they don't want to rush him too much. He's coming off so many injuries, basically hasn't pitched in two and a half years. He's still pitching rehab games at AAA. And McHugh gets Bichette for out number one to bring up Vladimir Guerrero Jr. who Buck did a little bit of everything yesterday. Boy did he ever. He's always exciting. He's going to do a lot of things to incite the fans and this is a terrific double. He hit the ball in the gap in right field and he's got a big smile as he always does and there how about thinking ahead. A little love for his mom. Hi yeah, mom. mom. <laughs> <laughs> He has a lot of fun. He's now reached base in 18 consecutive games. Springer at first with one down. And you can see McHugh against these right handed batters. The game plan is keep everything away, outer half or beyond. Yeah, he throws a lot of cut fastballs. He'll throw a sweeping breaking ball, also four seamer, an occasional curveball, but he's going to throw a lot of those pitches away. Cutter, a lot of cutters away from these right handed hitters. And glad he got it off the end of the bat. So in shallow left center the catch is made by Michael Harris two down. Yeah there's another moving fastball cut away from Vladdy hit it off the end of the bat. This might be a guy if he's staying out there righties might have to think right center field to do some damage on. Yeah it's quite an adjustment from what they saw on Friday with Spencer Strider and his big time fastball. Yesterday Bryce Elder threw sinkers and sliders and today there's going to be a lot of cutters at least from the opener. Column to Q. So now Dalton Varsho, who is playing center field today, Kevin Kiermeyer getting at least the start of the game off. So Varsho in center, Merrifield's in left. And a high fly ball down the right field line, not hit deep at all, and that ball's going to fall. Springer will be held at third, but Varsho's halfway between second and third, but scampers back. As Varsho thought Springer was going to try to score, but the ball falls in for a bloop double. Well, Ronald Acuna Jr. took a bad route to this ball. The ball was popped in the air. It looked like Varsho got jammed on an inside cutter. And watch the right fielder. He's going to break back initially, and that proves fatal. Those two steps he took back cost him the ability to make the catch. And then Springer running from first, he expects it to be caught. He didn't really bust it from first base, so he has to stop at third. Varsho assumed that Springer was going to score with two outs, and he didn't. And Luis Rivera, I was watching Louis, waited as long as he could to make a decision on Springer. So Springer at third, Varsho at second. And here's Matt Chapman quickly in the hole 0 and 2. Yeah, I mean, that's just the situation. George understands with two outs you run everything out and he could have scored had he been going full speed. But he assumed it was a routine fly ball. You see a ball popped up in the outfield with Acuna out there and you just assume OK that's a routine ball. He's just kind of jogging and then he sees Acuna is kind of late breaking and then he turns it on and it's too late by then Rivera's got to stop him. Well an infield hit and a bloop double can the Blue Jays take advantage of these two hits and can Matt Chapman maybe drive in a run or two here two and two the count as he reaches for it and again cut her away cut her away from the righties from McHugh. You know, in years past, hitters against McHugh would have moved closer to the plate because everything is away. But that's not the way hitters hit these days. They stay in the same spot. Let's go. And 
he stayed away and he got him. As the Blue Jays leave a couple of men on in the bottom of the first. To Hazel, but to Hazel's mom, Estralita, <laughs> who is uh, watching at home. Happy Mother's Day to Estralita and Hazel to you. Thank you, Dan. It is also, as you mentioned, Alec Manoa Bobblehead Day, and it's only fitting, a fitting day, really, to honor the person Manoa told me really helped shape the man he is today on and off the field. And we were first introduced to Alec's mom, Susanna, on our broadcast when she tearfully watched her son make his big league debut at Yankee Stadium. Now, earlier today, Susanna Anna threw out the ceremonial first pitch to her son. Manoa often talked about how Susanna, a single mom, struggled to give both her sons the essentials. She would often go hungry so we could eat, Manoa shared with me. Well, these days, Manoa has been able to provide his mom with whatever she needs. I'm super blessed to be able to do that, he said. But what she did for me and what she continues to, to do for me, there is no value. It doesn't have a price. I could never repay her for all she's done. Guys? He was so proud that she was going to be a part of this and that she was going to throw out the first pitch. As he looks on, not his day to pitch. He will start. He is scheduled to start the first game of the Yankees series tomorrow night. The Yankees are coming, folks. Big four game series starting tomorrow night, and Alec Manoa is going to be on the mound in game one. And that'll always be a special outing for him because he made his first big league start against the Yankees at Yankee Stadium. There's that slower breaking ball, the curveball that Kikuchi had not been throwing much at all, Buck, and then he threw 15 of them in his last start. Which is almost as many as he had thrown the entire season. Just a bit of a velocity change there. Back up to 95 with the fastball. And the out is recorded. A good play by Guerrero to get the tag down on Travis Darno. Well, good play by Darno, too, who reacted to that high throw as he tried to dive under the tag of Guerrero, but Vani came off the bag and was able to tag him out. Here's the throw from Bo. Takes his time and just airmails it across the diamond. And there's Vladdy to bend over and tag Darno. Very difficult for a base runner to react that quickly and slide underneath the tag. But he was still tagged out by Vladdy. So one down here's Marcelo Zuna, who, as we mentioned, has been on a, a real hot streak recently. Started the season ice cold, but now five home runs in his last eight games. As he lines one hard down the left field line, it'll stay in the ballpark, but it's up against the wall on a bounce. He's on his way to second, and he is safe. As somehow he got his left hand in there ahead of the tag attempt from Santiago Espinal. Yeah, Merrifield has played very well in left field. He made a very good throw, and Espinal just turned around and without really finding the base runner, tried to swipe at him and missed the tag. Merrifield plays this ball very well. This is his 12th start in left field, and he's played well out there. And you can see Espinal just kind of swiped at the base runner, and Ozuna takes that left arm away from him and touches the base with his left hand. You see the swipe tag, no contact. And now if you're wondering what this is, look who's back in town. Kevin Pillar getting a big ovation. Yep, he feels it. He means that. Uh, you and I both have had a chance to speak to him here over the weekend, uh, and he is beyond appreciative of what the organization and the fans of the Blue Jays did for him and have meant to him over the years. 32nd round pick way back in 2011, and was basically the Blue Jays' everyday center fielder for 2015 to through 2018. And how many times did we see him run into a wall or dive or crash and you know, give everything he had to make the play. He knows he was never the most talented player in the big leagues, but boy, did he and does he play hard. And he was awfully excited to come back here to Toronto this week. You know, this is not his first visit back to Toronto after the trade. He came back shortly after the trade in 2019 with the Giants. But everything was so fresh that he didn't really have the chance to enjoy the return. He was still kind of surprised that he was traded initially to begin with. So this has been a special return trip for him. 
I asked him who on this team did you play with and there are only two guys Danny Jansen and Tim Mesa but the staff especially a lot of the, the behind the scenes staff that maybe the fans wouldn't know the the trainers in the, in the medical staff they're all here and you know Kevin Pillar very close relationship with all of them lots of hugging going on on the field the last couple of days. In the air to right center. Varsho sets up to make the catch. Runner tagging and will beat the throw to third. Ozuna in there now with two down. Now, Don Varsho will tell you he doesn't have the strongest of arms. Boy, he did everything right. He got behind that baseball, got himself in a good position to make a throw, and knew that he had to really air it out to try to cut down the runner at third. He's just too deep, but you see how he momentum goes right into that throw, and he knows that the only chance he has is to basically airmail it all the way to third, but it wasn't in time. So runner at third, but two down, and here's Michael Harris, the second. Rookie of the year last year in the National League, hitting just 214 this year. Another one of the guys the Braves locked up early on in his rookie season. They signed him to an eight year, $72 million deal with a couple of option years. You know what that does for a player? It just gives him that sense of security. Now his financial security has been taken care of. He doesn't have to worry about ups and downs. He just goes out and plays. And then if you become the player they expect you to be, you can hit the jackpot when you become a free agent. And he's from Georgia, right? Grew up yeah, rooting for the Braves. Too. That helps too. <laughs> they traded for Matt Olson. He's from Atlanta. That that never hurts. <laughs> Guys may be more willing to sign when it's your, you know, the team you rooted for as a kid that drafts you or trades for you. So many players that have played for the Braves have made it their lifelong home. They just stay in that community. They've always enjoyed their relationship with the surrounding area of Atlanta. The 2 2. And that's going to get through into right field. A base hit for Harris to bring home Ozuna and make it 2 to nothing Atlanta. Michael Harris, the second, hasn't had the kind of start that he anticipated, but this is a big base hit with two outs as he gets that. Slider up and out of the zone, and he's able to put it in play. Puts it past Vladdy in the right field to chase home Ozuna. So now the number nine hitter, Orlando Arcia, the shortstop. And a swing and a foul tip on that 86 mile an hour breaking ball. It's 0 1. Harris can run stole 20 bases and 22 tries last year as a rookie. Four for four so far this season. Thirty six pitches thrown by Kikuchi 25 of them strikes. That ratio has been a lot better this year. Every now and again, you get one of the ones that we just saw, just a non competitive pitch, but way fewer than last year. Bouncer up the middle, and a great spot for Espinal to meet it and step on the bag to force the runner and end the top of the second. Go is their base running, and one of the reasons for that buck is a full year of Whit Merrifield. Yeah, and he has really played well. He's earned the opportunity to play an awful lot. He had three steals in the game yesterday. And he just makes the defense edgy. When he's on base, you never know what to expect, and he can do a lot of things to beat you. In large part due to Merrifield, the Blue Jays have now moved into the top 10 of the majors in both stolen bases this year and stolen base percentage. 
one looks like it'll get out of play and they have stolen 21 consecutive bases since anybody was last caught that was back on April the 22nd. Yeah and they're really doing a good job of picking the situations watching the count reading the pitcher on the mound getting good jumps. You know it really helps when you have a guy like Varsho around and you bring in Merrifield who have had success in stolen bases at a high rate. They'll sit and talk. Kiermaier is another guy that's always been a high percentage base stealer. But they'll talk about pitchers and what they see from a pitcher. And more often than not you're going to steal a base for off the pitcher. You're not going to steal it so much off the catcher but catchers are going to have to throw much better than they have the last several years. Popped up. Backpedaling. All bees and it drops. He and Acuna come together. The ball falls and Merrifield's at second. You can see Albies was in trouble the moment that ball went in the air. And Acuna, I don't know if he didn't hear Albies calling for it, but he collided with him and kind of knocked the ball out of Albies' glove. Merrifield pops it up and here he's jogging up the line and you can see Acuna there and he gets in Albie's way and the ball falls safely. I tell you what the Braves have not played good defense especially in the outfield in this series. Friday night Acuna lost the ball in the twilight. Today he let one drop in front of him near the foul line and right there they allow Merrifield to get on second base with nobody out. All these, pop up. Yeah all these is charged with the air at, at, for for now at least. And you talked about Merrifield making the other teams edgy. We see it right away. A step off. He's not always going to try to steal the base. He said that. He has said that in interviews. But he wants the other team to think there's always a chance that he's going to try to steal a base just to get in the mind of the pitcher and the catcher a bit. Yeah, and you divide the attention between home plate and second base. And if he shuffles off far enough without. Colin McHugh stopping him. He'll break for third. He is easily uh, the top base dealer of third base over the last six, seven years in the majors. Nobody else is even close. And again, maybe this is why McHugh's not throwing strikes right now to Brandon Bell. Maybe he is, maybe not. He thinks it's the baseball. But something, you know, it's different now than with the new rules. The disengagement rule, the bases are bigger, there's shorter distance between first and second and second and third. So all of those things have factored in. Plus, pitchers aren't used to this. They haven't done it for a bunch of years. And nobody out left handed batter with the plate is a highly unlikely time for Whit Merrifield to try to steal third. You're more likely to go with a righty up, you know, as a catcher, makes it harder with a right handed batter in the box. You're more likely to go with one out, but he wants them to think there's always a chance. That gets off the glove of Riley and down the left field line. Merrifield's going to get the wave and come in to score. Right now if you're the Blue Jays you're just saying put it in play good things are happening. Yeah the Braves have not had a good series defensively and right there that ball's got to be caught Riley just couldn't knock it down at third base. Merrifield has to hold his ground as this ball is hit toward the third baseman. So here just a backhanded ball that he swipes at it goes past him it'll be a base hit and Merrifield's going to score easily. See how he has to hold ground because it was right at the third baseman. But he deflected it to a point where it's down the left field line and he scores standing up. So the Blue Jays on the board down two to one still nobody out belted first. Brian Snitker can't like what he is seeing. Defensively. The batter Danny Jansen. Had an RBI double in the eighth inning yesterday an insurance run for the Blue Jays. And he hooks this ball to left for a base hit. Belt up to second. Danny Jansen started to swing a little more consistently. This is another one of those sweepers. You see, it didn't sweep, it just stayed on the inside part of the plate, and Danny gets to it. It's a line drive in front of Kevin Pillar, his former teammate. So the three. 
hitters in this inning have all reached base and the Blue Jays have cashed in to make it a one run game. Two on with nobody out and the first at bat of the day for Santiago Espinal hitting in the nine spot getting the start at second base. Braves just used a mound visit. Espinal not starting a whole lot against righties but with Kiermaier out Merrifield in the outfield Espinal at second today. And he squares and he gets it down and it's a good one and he's going to beat it out. <laughs> Boy they can miss right now just put it in play and good things keep happening. Boy, when you don't play very often you have to really deliver on these situations and boy does he ever Kiermaier is normally in the ninth spot but Espinal gets the start and he squares around and drops down a beautiful bunt. This is obviously a sacrifice bunt. McHugh can't make a play on it and Riley knows he has no play. So the Blue Jays have loaded the bases on a terrific bunt by Espinal. He'll be credited with a base hit. And now Springer sends the first pitch down the left field line but foul. Isn't it interesting how the air has just created all this momentum and you open the door for a good team like the Blue Jays and chances are they're going to kick that door wide open. Defense is so important the Blue Jays have seen how it's helped them this year. But if you make the plays you're supposed to it's going to keep the offense in check. Back to the mound coming home for one and down to first as they turn the one two three double play. Uh, that's obviously the last place you want to hit it but right to the pitcher and McHugh takes his time he makes a good throw to Darno, who clears the base path and makes a strong throw to first. The Springer's retired. You don't see this an awful lot but boy that's a big play for the Braves. And you can see the dejection on the face of Springer. And now is there some sort of a challenge going on. Toronto is challenging the outcall at home plate. Was Darno's foot not on the plate when he caught the ball. Yeah that's uh, obviously a big time challenge right here. Last Diaz is the crew chief of this umpiring crew. Darno took the throw from McHugh and obviously you expect that he stepped on home plate. This will give you a good idea. His foot is actually Boy, behind, it's behind the home plate. plate. But did he sweep they it across, it across there? Yeah. That's going to be very difficult to overturn. Yeah. You can't tell from that angle, obviously, but it appears as though he was behind the plate and looked like he swiped his foot across home plate. I mean, that's the one thing you do as a catcher when you have that chance. You find where home plate is with your right foot. That's the first thing you do. So the Blue Jays are risking a challenge here. Here's another look at it, but watch his right foot. It's going to be right at the point of home plate. After there. you, the call at home is confirmed. The runner is out. Toronto loses his challenge. Yeah, that's a, that's a risky challenge right there early in the game because the catcher was behind the plate, but naturally he's going to swipe his foot across home plate. But clearly, when you look at the overhead view, he wasn't in contact with home plate, but it's very difficult to overturn that call. So the Blue Jays lose their challenge. The end result is runners at second and third, two down. Here's another look. Clearly not on the plate there, but. Yeah, you can't tell yeah. if he slid across the plate, but he certainly yeah. made the move that would suggest he did. So now looking for a big two out base hit from Bo Bichette. Might get a better look at the drag yeah. of the foot right there. He yeah. drug it right across yeah. home plate. Two on Bichette. It's been an interesting inning. A drop pop up that went as an error. Uh, another ball hit to the third baseman. It got by him in the left. A bunt single. A one, two, three double play. A challenge. Blue Jays have one, but hoping for more. And again, a McHugh. I guess you could say he's an opener. They're hoping to get three innings out of him. 
Nobody is up in the bullpen right now for Atlanta. Well, everything has been away, as you mentioned, Dan, and Bo, he's got a good idea where that outside corner is right now. He's laying off those borderline pitches. And it's a full count. Got a base open. Got Vladimir Guerrero Jr. in the on deck circle. I don't think McHugh is going to give in to Bo. He's still going to make a pitch probably off the plate outside. Ooh, he got away with one. Yeah, that's Ooh. one of the few he's left over the heart of the plate. Yeah, that was right down Broadway. Trying to go away, and you can see, I mean, that's on the inner half of the plate. Not every mistake is crushed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he might not want to make it again. That's where he wants it. Or closer to where he wants it. See, this is another great illustration of how pitchers, if they make their pitches, chances are they're going to get you out, even if you know they're going to throw it in that spot. Everybody knows McHugh's pitching him away. And I always laugh when everybody says, well, you know he's pitching away. Just hit it over there. Okay. That's easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's 90 and it's moving. Yeah. yeah. Although the guy at the plate can do that about as well as anybody right now. Up and in. And that's ball four to load him up for Guerrero. He didn't cross him up. He took one shot inside and he just had this one get away from him. And Bo was obviously looking out over the plate, so he's a little bit late getting out of there. And Rick Kranitz, the pitching coach, is out to the mound, and that's also a sign for the bullpen to get out. Michael Tonkin, who's another guy who can go multiple innings, looks like he is going to be next. A guy who until this year had not pitched to the major since 2017. Rick Kranitz has the ultimate trust in his catcher, Travis Darno. The first message was to Darno, and then he went on to McHugh, both veterans obviously, and they're not going to get rattled in this situation, but they've had a tough customer to play with the bases loaded. Three career grand slams for Vladimir Guerrero Jr., who hit a fly ball to center his first time up. It went right off the end of the bat, a ball that was just off the outside corner. Blue Jays have but one grand slam this year. That's Matt Chapman. Good one to take. It's a ball and a strike. Laddie's talking to himself about his process and keeping that front shoulder in. Jensen in to score and Espinal behind him as Guerrero gives the Blue Jays the lead. So difficult to work your way through this top of the order for the Blue Jays and if Bo doesn't get you chances are Vladdy's going to get you and he hits a rocket right back up the middle. No chance for Albies who was shaded in that direction. It skips right past him into center. Jansen in the score right behind him. Espinal and Guerrero picks up two more RBIs. That'll give him 24. And extend a streak of reaching base to 19 consecutive games. There's Dalton Varsho who doubled his first time up. A ball that Ronald Cooney Jr. just never quite got to down the right field line. But I'll tell you, if you're Brian Snitker, the last thing you want to see in a bullpen day is your first guy have to throw 47 pitches through an inning in two thirds. Atlanta's going to have to go through a lot of pitchers today. 
30th pitch of the second inning right here. And a good take by Varsho. 3 and 0. Now yeah, he's going to have the green light here. He's seen a lot of pitches and everything is coming into him right now. This is a good opportunity for Varsho. Ball four to load him up again. Let's go to Hazel May. Dan Matt Chapman told me that he sees a more mature Vladimir Guerrero Jr. as a hitter. He says he's getting pitched real tough every time he comes to the plate, but he can still drive the ball to any part of the field. I feel like he's got a really good ability to stay behind the baseball, and you don't see him take very many bad swings this year. He's always on balance, and then Chapman laughed and said, I feel like the guy's just heating up, which is super scary. Damn. That's what uh, everybody is hoping for. Hazel, thank you. End of the day for Colin and McHugh as the Braves go to the pen. Here at Rogers Center and everybody out there watching and there is my mom you can see in the white sweater with the sunglasses on that's my mom Ellie second from the left uh, on the right is my sister Lena in the blue cap happy Mother's Day to Lena as well that's those are my two nephews Shane sitting beside Lena and then Drew over on the left uh, part of the gang came in from London they live in London and came in for the game today so mom we love you happy Mother's Day and we'll see you at dinner. <laughs> Absolutely. Happy Mother's Day, everybody out there, including my wife Arlene, who's down in Florida. This he will be with Arlene later on. And happy uh, Mother's Day as well to uh, my wife Lauren and to Sarah. Uh, wishing uh, everybody out there a very happy Mother's Day today. Michael Tonkin is into the game for the Atlanta Braves. Michael Tonkin came up with the Minnesota Twins. This is his first season with the Braves as Dan mentioned. He had been out of the big leagues for a long time 2017 before this season. That was the last time he pitched in the bigs. He's six seven can create a challenging angle for hitters. And again a guy who hadn't pitched to the majors before this year since 2017 he is pitched in Japan he has pitched in Mexico he has pitched in independent ball tough spot to inherit although there are two outs on the board it's the ninth man to bat in this inning and it all started with an error by the second baseman on a routine pop up. Two and two the count on Matt Chapman and that's strike three called and Chapman is not happy about that as he makes his feelings felt to Andy Fletcher the home plate umpire the Blue Jays though do take the lead a two run single up the middle for Vladimir Guerrero Junior and it's three two at the end of a couple of innings. Six five app and check out the latest odds for today's baseball games. Lots going on in the first couple of innings today. The Blue Jays now up three to two, going to the top of the third, top of the order. Ronald Acuna Jr., who homered to lead off the ball game, his eighth home run of the season. Uh, as good of a power speed combo as there is in the majors today. Just about a quarter of the way through the season a buck but if he keeps doing what he's doing he's got a chance to do something only two other players have ever done and that's hit 20 or more homers which should be easy and steal 70 or more bases and you never know with the way the game has changed a little bit this year wide strike zone continues the only two players ever to hit 20 or more homers and steal 70 or more bases Ricky Henderson that's the easy one and Eric Davis. One of my all time favorite players just such an incredible player had some great years for Cincinnati back in the 80s and unfortunately injuries kind of in the second half of his career prevented him from really being the player longer that he could have been but what a talent. He was a tremendous player. 
Can do a lot of things on the baseball field. Great combination of speed and power. You know, I asked Ron Washington on Friday afternoon, I said, give me a comp for Ron Lacuna Jr. Washington's been in the game forever. He's managed, he's coached. Took him a while to come up with Josh Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting comp. Rounder to third. Chapman's got to hurry and doesn't get him. Couldn't come up with it cleanly right away, and with the speed of Acuna, that was the difference. All right, Acuna, he puts a lot of pressure on the defense, and Chapman knew he had to hustle out of the box. It's going to be an air charge to Chapman, just his third of the season, but Acuna beats the throw as he gets over to it and just went off his glove. He never got it in the pocket of his glove. It hit on the outside of his glove, and he couldn't make the play. So Acuna's aboard to start the inning. And now first pitch swinging Matt Olson skies one into shallow left center and Varsho the center fielder today taking charge out there one down. So now Ozzie Albies who struck out his first time up we mentioned outstanding like phenomenal numbers against lefties this year and even in his career he's hitting 336 against lefties that's the highest average for any active player with a minimum of 500 plate appearances and Acuna's dancing over at first well Albies like so many switch hitters is a natural right handed hitter so it would make sense that he'd be so dominant from this side he has become a switch hitter and just doesn't have the same fluid moves from the left side as he does from the right side. Pitch out. They were guessing with the Braves, and Cunha wasn't going. He picked up on it. Did you say pitch out? I did. <laughs> I we think don't. it's the first time I've said it this year. <laughs> we don't say pitch out much anymore. We used to say pitch out all the time, but maybe the pitch out will make a bit of a comeback. I mean, when you were catching. Very common for you to call for a pitch. Yeah, right? we would call them on our own a lot. And obviously, when I played, there were so many great base runners, base stealers, Bert Campanellis, Billy North, Bobby Bonds, all those guys running off a lot. And it was a big part of the game. So the catchers had the freedom to call their own pitch outs. Of course, we called our own games, too. Mm -hmm. A ball and two strikes. Guerrero trying to block Acuna's view over at first, and the pitch skips away from Jansen. And up to second it goes Acuna. All right, that ball was in the dirt, and Danny Jansen, probably a little bit aware that Acuna might be running, is trying to backhand it, and it looks like the ball down in front. You see, he got a piece of it on his catcher's mitt, but Acuna will easily go to second on the wild pitch. I'd be very aware on this first pitch of Acuna at second. Espinal taking a step closer to the bag to try to keep him there. And now three and two. And just like we were saying about the impact that Merrifield can have on opposing pitchers, Acuna can do that and maybe even a little bit more. Yeah, he stole second and third in the seventh inning in the game yesterday. Three two and fouled off by Albies. Fifty pitches through two and a third thrown by Kikuchi. And he hasn't walked anybody just a lot of long at bats Albies has fouled off a bunch of pitches in each of his two at bats. And he hits a high drive to left field. Merrifield is going back, feeling for the wall, and he's going to watch it go. Albies with his 10th home run of the season puts Atlanta back on top. 
Well, he saw a lot of pitches in that at bat, and that certainly gave him an awful lot of information. That ball looked like it was up a little bit, and he took kind of a tomahawk swing at it and hit it out of the ballpark. Looked like Merrifield thought it was going to stay in the yard, the four-seam fastball. It is up. You can see how he really extends through that hitting zone, and it's a high fly ball. Not really sure if he got enough of it, but it just sneaks over the wall in left field. Now Austin Riley. And you say Kikuchi even with things going well and they have been going well this year still prone to hard contact still prone to giving up some home runs he had given up eight home runs in seven games coming into today and he's been touched up a couple of times already this afternoon. The reason he gives up hard contact is because everything he throws is relatively hard. Unlike Chris Bassett who has such a wide gap between velocities and he will have a lot of soft contact but Kikuchi is one of those guys that everything is kind of hard and the guys respond to it at the plate they hit it hard when he makes his pitches of course he has success but with Bassett and so many different speeds and so many different pitches there's an awful lot of soft contact in his game. And maybe that's why we're seeing we just saw it there him trying to mix in that curveball a little bit more just to vary it up. That's the split change a pitch that at times he's had a really good feel for this year uh, but at times not and when it's not working you'll kind of see it out there and it's not he won't get a chase on it. Yeah, there's the grip and you can see he never really finished the pitch it was something his arm was dragging on. You know I, I talked to you Kevin Gosman a couple of days ago about how a pitcher has maybe five or six games where everything is working for him all season long and it's so easy to forget that little looper over the head of Guerrero into very shallow right a base hit for Riley. Well was cued right off the end of the bat Riley was out in front of it he has been pretty quiet in this series so far. He had a soft base hit to right field in the game yesterday. Took an 0 for 4 on Friday night. And this one is another just cue shot off the end of the bat that he dumps into right field. So Pete Walker is out to the mound. Nobody is up. Doesn't look like uh, they made a phone call down to the bullpen to get anybody loose. This is just going out and trying to give a little advice here to Kikuchi on how to change things around here. So two runs in on the home run by Albies a runner at first one out and here's Travis Darno. Really the backup catcher now they traded for Sean Murphy one of the best catchers in the game but they can utilize either one as the DH sometimes to keep them both in the lineup. But Darno suffered a concussion earlier this year the fourth concussion of his major league career and as a former catcher buck I'm sure you can relate I mean that is always a concern with a guy who's been back there as many years as Darno has. Yeah the Braves probably have the best one two combination of catchers in all of baseball with Sean Murphy and Travis Darno. And Travis understands his position and he has been so helpful to Sean Murphy in getting acquainted with his pitching staff Murphy's in his first season after the trade from Oakland. But they have quite a rich core of catchers and catcher coaches on this team. Sal Fasano, a former Blue Jay catcher and coach in the minor leagues, he is the catching instructor. Eddie Perez is also on the team. He's a former big league catcher for Atlanta for a number of years. And boy, when they have their pitcher meetings, they've got a lot of information, a lot of resources to lean on. One two. This is inside with a fastball. You know when there's a value that a guy like this can bring 
even if he's not catching 100 games a year, even if he's catching 50 or 60, he's he's in all the pitchers' meetings when Murphy is in there, and you get into the playoffs and just you know his experience and his ability to help younger players just so good. Swing and a miss here to get him. Kikuchi with his fourth strike out of the day. Yeah, after the leadoff home run to Acuna, Kikuchi struck out the side to end the first inning, and that's that hard slider. You could see going out with a big swing with two strikes, but he cuts right over the top of it. So two down. Here's Marcelo Zuna, who doubled his first time up after hitting a home run in yesterday's game. Seven runs, 11 hits, and a couple of errors between the two teams already in this game. And this one popped up shallow left. Merrifield coming in and over to his right to make the catch and retire the side. But the Albies home run has put the Braves back on top. First pitch on Mother's Day, and it's Alec Manoa. Bobblehead day. And Alex spent, uh, we are told, about 20 minutes out there signing autographs, signing bobbleheads, and even gave his cap to a young fan on his way off the field. That's the way you do it. Absolutely. You know what? These guys have so much free time, and why not take another 20, 30 minutes to sign autographs? You will create fans for a lifetime, and Alex Manoa, he gets it. He understands. He's not that far removed from being a kid fan himself. Yep. And he's big about giving back down in Miami where he's from doing kids clinics and, and things like that does a lot of that in the offseason. Here's Whit Merrifield who reached on an error and scored in the three run bottom of the second. Michael Tonkin took over last inning for Colin McHugh. Struck out Matt Chapman as the Blue Jays left the bases loaded. They've stranded five through two innings. Well, you mentioned seven runs in this game. The two teams had combined for a total of 10 runs in the first two games of this series. Different story today. And he pokes it softly into right for a base hit. Blue Jays lineup is getting deeper and deeper all the time. You can see Tompkins sidearm delivery that fastball out over the plate and Maryfield just takes it the other way. It's it toward the end of the bat but he gets enough of it to shoot it into right field. This is how the second inning began with Maryfield reaching base. And now he gets to do his thing which is try to be a nuisance to the pitcher. Here's Brandon Belt who had an RBI single his first time up. Mark Budzinski, the first base coach for the Blue Jays, just relayed how quick Tonkin is to the plate as Merrifield draws a throw. You mentioned Tonkin is 6 7, so you would think he would have a very slow delivery to the plate. That's not the case at all. He's pretty quick. And there goes Merrifield. Pitch taken for a strike, throw down, not in time. Number 12 on the season for Merrifield, and it's number five in this series. All right, he gets a good jump, as Dan mentioned. He is 12 for 13 now, and he gets a good read right there. Darno makes the throw with short half, just a little bit short of the mark. If that ball carries all the way through, it'll be a little bit closer, but I think Merrifield had that one stolen easily. Pop back foul by Belt, still 0 and 2. Oh, 
Oh boy. And Belt is not happy. The strike zone has been wide and high both ways so far today. And Belt is the latest hitter to be frustrated. Yeah, Andy Fletcher is one of the senior umpires, and he's been around a long time and a very good umpire. And his strike zone has just been a little bit wide, but it's been consistently wide for both clubs. And this ball is up and maybe off the plate in both fashions, up high and way outside. So now Danny Jansen, who had a base hit to left his first time up. I mean, as a hitter, if a, if one of your teammates comes back to the dugout and says, "Hey, boys, it's it's big today," yeah, you just got to make adjustments as hitters. You can't allow them to call those borderline pitches. Popped up, third base side, and playable in foul territory. Arcia calls off Riley and makes the catch as we send it down to the field and Hazel May. Dan you know this franchise is used to be known as a, a franchise that can out homer teams. Well Kevin Kiermeyer told me we've got so many different weapons in this clubhouse. We can reach in so many ways. We can steal bases. We can bunt. We can reach with our speed and aggressiveness one through nine. You heard Buck mention the word momentum. Well Kiermeyer agrees. He said we are trying to create momentum along the base pass and make things happen put that pressure on that starting pitcher guys. Yeah Kevin is very happy for a lot of different reasons. He loves playing in front of 40,000 <laughs> fans. That's for one and and he loves the style of play. I mean if you're a Kiermaier if you're a Merrifield and you know this style of play is being encouraged this year that that suits you very well. Yeah it sure does and, and it puts so much pressure on the pitcher of course but also on the defense. When you're on the bases and you're a threat to steal the infielders have to keep their eye on you as well whether you're a in middle infielder and you're at first base or a third baseman with a runner at second base. He takes one last peek at that runner at second before he focuses on the hitter. And you know what if you take a glance to your left to look at that base runner by the time you get back to home plate it might be a little bit too late. If there were one out here Merrifield probably would have tried for third already with two outs much less likely to do it because he's very likely to score on a base hit from second with two outs. And what happens a lot of times in these situations is Brian Snitker will probably tell the third baseman don't worry about a stolen base with two outs because that'll take you out of your defensive positioning with a right handed hitter. Just concede third base with two outs just hold your ground. Full count on Espinal, who had a bunt single his first time up. Just foul. And again, as Tonkin came set and looked back. Merrifield is all over the place out there and, and and he's not running but he just wants to bother Tonkin as much as he can. Yeah and you wonder about the hitter at the plate is that a distraction but I'm sure Merrifield has checked with his teammates to find out is this bothering you if I bounce around because he is going to bounce all over the place with Tonkin just to put something in his mind. Three two to Espinal's popped up for Albies. So they get Merrifield aboard. He steals another base, but he's stranded, and we th we are through three. Against Yusei Kikuchi, here was his greeting in his first at bat today. Good job too by Andy Fletcher the home plate umpire who called off the pitch clock and let the moment happen and again uh, Kevin Pilar met a lot to people here and I think a little 
we talked about two things one a 30 second round pick people kind of could relate to him being an overachiever and then just how hard he played every time he was out there. Yeah I think those are the two things that people remember about him because the odds of him making it to the big leagues were very long indeed and then once he got here he's closing in on 10 years of service and that's the big milestone for any major league player. First of all 10 years you are a good player for a long time. Secondly you become a fully vested member of the retirement plan for Blue Jays or Major League Baseball players and Kevin Millar should be very proud of the career he's put together at this point. Hit a fly ball to center his first time up. John Schneider managed Kevin Pillar in 2011 in Vancouver. Pilar gives it a ride and this one is going to carry out of here with ease deep into the Blue Jays bullpen as Pilar does some damage to his old team here making it a five to three game. Well the Blue Jays didn't have to be that hospitable to him <laughs> and gave up a home run and boy he got on top of that high fastball as well and. You know he's been a good player for a long time as we mentioned now he understands he's a part time player and he gets that cut fastball he knows he got enough of it to hit it out of the ballpark. Pilar that is his 30th career home run here at Rogers Center. And that has to be an extra special feeling for him. That's his 101st career home run. And there was not much doubt about it. That's the third home run that Kikuchi surrendered here today. Lead off home run to Acuna, two run shot to Albies, and now a solo shot to Pilar here in the fourth. One and two now the count on Harris. John Schneider said it when he was with Pilar in the minors you know the coaches would sit around after the game and say you know what he helps us win a game every day like he may not be a first round pick or anything as Harris is called out on strikes but he just did things to help you win games and Schneider kind of paused and then he said he had a lot of support amongst the coaches who had him in the minor leagues. Yeah everybody that had Kevin Pillar for a while would send in reports that the numbers might not be off the chart but he will win games for you. And that was part of his M.O. as he made his way to the big leagues. Remember too he was a pretty good base stealer I think against the Yankees he stole second third and home in a single inning. It's hard to do. Very hard. <laughs> I think one thing that just would have meant the world to him, and unfortunately, and Kevin Kiermeyer is part of the problem, but Kevin Pillar never won a gold glove. And, uh, you know, for uh, two, three of those years as the everyday center fielder for the Blue Jays, as Arcia Lines went into center field, you know, he certainly was under consideration. I think he was a gold glove finalist once, twice, just when. When that started coming in, but part of the problem was Kevin Kiermeyer was uh, so good in some of those years for Tampa Bay. Yeah, they were very similar, not only because they were both 30th round picks in the draft, but neither one of them played in a high profile college program, and they were just kind of overachievers throughout their minor league career and became very good major league players. Ronald Acuna Jr. who has homered and reached on an air and hits one up the middle past a diving Bichette into left center. Arcia on his way to third. Varsho overran it for a second but it didn't end up changing the play. It'll be first and third one out as we send it down to Hazel May. Dan I asked Pilar whether it was weird to see Kevin Kiermeyer in a Blue Jays uniform playing center field. He said no but I have to admit we did have a bit of a rivalry when he was with Tampa Bay. He said we both thought we were the best at our positions at the time. Of course he got the gold gloves but I always wanted to one up him and Pilar acknowledged that the Blue Jays have a long history of talented center fielders and he said look I think it's cool to see that position in good hands guys 
Hazel thank you I go back to Vernon Wells a little bit earlier obviously a very good center fielder but Kiermaier won the gold glove we mentioned Pilar was the everyday center fielder for four years here from 15 through 18 and Kiermaier won the gold glove in 15 and 16 which might have been maybe the best chances for Pilar to win a gold glove. Who was the center fielder before Kevin Pilar. You got me. Kobe Rasmus. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. How about that. You know he had a pretty prominent role here for a while but Pilar took over and was part of those good 15 and 16 teams. Pete Walker another visit to the mound. And at the same time activity in the bullpen Trevor Richards now throwing. Yeah, I'm sure John Snyder would like to stick with the starters as long as he can given this long stretch of games and the fact that they play so many consecutive games in a row. And try to save as many bullets down in that bullpen as you can. Went around and it's 0 and 2 now on Matt Olson. Boy, after that last check swing right there, I would really lean toward throwing him a hard breaking ball down and away here. Because he's cheating to get to the fastball. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah, they're making plans here in a hurry. Whoa, and they got him. But remember, there's a runner at third. And now the throw across the diamond, and at the end of all that, everybody is safe. Everybody's back where they started. Yeah, and the unfortunate thing was that they had Kikuchi involved in the rundown, and Vladdy and Bo, they did what they're supposed to do. Kikuchi had to take the return throw to first base, and Acuna, he stayed in that rundown long enough to force the Blue Jays into a mistake. Acuna was guessing right there and gets picked off but he stays in the rundown for a long time and there's Kikuchi now he looks over across the diamond had he made a good throw they had a shot at Arcia. So still first and third one out and the O2 is outside ball one remember Albies is on deck and he is lethal against left handed pitching this year. So that may be why they want to make sure to get Richards ready in a hurry. He might be coming in. Turn all these around. And a swing and a miss to get Olsen for out number two. And now the decision belongs to John Schneider. And he's got Trevor Richards ready if he wants to make a move. And Mattingly and Schneider are talking about it. What do you think, Donnie? Well you know this guy's had some good swings at Kikuchi we got Richards ready a lot of discussion going on right now. That was interesting. Mattingly a former manager. John Snyder asking him his opinion. Pete Walker was involved as well so they have decided to stick with Kikuchi here. Always homered his last time up he struck out in the first. You know we see all these moves and John Snyder went to the mound in the eighth inning on Friday night talked to Chris Bassett left him in the game. Got to remember this is John Snyder's first year as a manager and he is confident enough in his own abilities to lean on a former big league manager like Don Mattingly. That speaks volumes of John Snyder's confidence and he's going to be open to some advice from a veteran manager. And Don Mattingly is happy to help him out. This is a great, great tandem right here. And you know, they're still talking about it. The 1 1. And there for strike two called. You know, if you're a manager and you have put together a coaching staff, shame on you for not leaning on them. You know you can't make decisions all by yourself and there's so much information so much experience between Walker and Mattingly and Dave Hudgens the entire coaching staff. 
And leaving him in there pays off as he strikes out Albies to retire the side. Acquired in the offseason by the Blue Jays. George Springer didn't know him at all. But boy, has he taken a liking to him. First of all, you can tell George is feeling better. And if you want George to be in a good mood, just send Dalton Varsho over near him. That'll cheer George up every time. They love him. <laughs> totally different personalities, but yeah. they are very, very close. And Dalton, of course, is very low key. Springer is anything but low right. key, and yeah. they really get along great. Yeah, that's the key. George <laughs> is happy to do 90% of the talking, and Varsho's happy to do 90% of the listening. Absolutely. It's a great combination. <laughs> Springer leading off the bottom of the fourth. They were in the same hitting group all through spring training. Obviously, as outfielders, they were doing drills together along with Kevin Kiermeyer all through spring training. You know what? And George Springer deserves a lot of credit, too, because he signed here as a free agent. He was the incumbent outfielder, but they bring in Kiermeyer and Varsho, and Springer said, I'll slide to right. Whatever you guys want to do, we're three outfielders together. We'll work together as a unit. He did a good job of embracing the two new outfielders here. And it all started in spring training. Mark Budzinski, the first base coach, also the outfield coach, had these guys together all the time, all three of them. And we've told this story a couple of times, once back in the spring. So. Bud does a lot of drills with the outfielders and even more in the spring probably than during the season and he would text Kiermaier Springer and say hey do you want to meet at three o'clock and do this drill or that drill and the answer would come back is Varsh OK with it always and it eventually became kind of a tongue in cheek joke yeah. between the group but it originated with Springer and Kiermaier having so much respect for Varsho who's much younger than the two of them that they always wanted to check with Bud to see if our show was OK with. The yeah. Players. What's Dalton want to yeah. do. <laughs> <laughs> what does Dalton think we should right. do. And it's not like our has got that personality where he's made you know hey make sure it's OK with me. Springer with a high drive to left. And that is up and gone up above the fence and the signal is for a home run. As Springer hits it out for his fifth of the season. Springer is two for three and had a big opportunity in the second when he hit the ball back to the pitcher for a one two three double play but he gets a run back here to make it a one run game once again. He makes things happen when he is healthy he can carry a team. And that's one of those where with the renovations here with the ballpark a little bit different than in past years. You know the wall different height you got that railing. Uh, up above it and Springer hit it just up above the fence looked like it rattled off the railing a little bit. As Bichette pops it up. Olsen drops the ball. And then Bichette thrown out trying to get to second. As he was standing on or near first base at the time the ball was dropped then made the decision to go and by then it was too late. Absolutely. And you know what the way the Braves have played in the outfit especially you can't assume anything's going to be caught. And here Bo pops it up and you can see him jogging up the first baseline. Olsen's battling it and it goes right off his glove. But Bo is standing on first base when the ball hit the turf and he's thrown out easily and you know he knows he made a mistake. And that's why he was punching the bag pounding the base out at second upset with himself. Yeah I don't think either manager is happy right now. Brian Snitker is not thrilled with the defense obviously that's been going on all day long. Vladdy grounds one down to third and John Schneider wants a team that does all of the little things well and generally they have been a great base running team this year but a couple of times here they have made mistakes on the bases. Well, right here you can see him assuming that that ball is going to be caught. And then when it hits he was just one step around first base and once you make the mistake of not hustling out of the box you can't make a second mistake of trying to advance and cover up that first mistake. 
Now Varsho lines one well hit ball left center field but Harris runs it down. And that's out number three. The Blue Jays get a run on the home run by George Springer and out trail five to four. Run of the season in the bottom of the fourth. A high five ball and hits just over the top of the fence up against that metal railing beyond the fence and Pilar jumps but it's well beyond his reach and it hits above that light blue top of the wall and that's out of the ballpark that's a home run. Yeah but hits the blue padding and comes back in that's in play but anything above that where the railing is that's a home run and it I think it's one thing that maybe because we can't see it anymore we forget that it existed that there was always a gap between the wall and then the stands and balls would be hit and disappear down onto like the service corridor back there but another way that it's been reconfigured the fans are much closer to the play. As Riley lines the ball into left field, a base hit to get it started here in the top of the fifth. Anthony Bass now up in the bullpen. And the Blue Jays like Bass more against right handed batters generally, and this is kind of that part of the lineup. Uh, and here's John Schneider out and he's going to make the change with a, a slew of right handed batters due up for the Braves. So not the outing that you say Kikuchi was hoping for as he is out of this game one batter into the fifth. This Mother's Day, join Major League Baseball and Susan G. Komen in the fight against breast cancer. Scan the QR code displayed on your screen to learn more. And again, if you go to MLB.com, this is part of a big Mother's Day initiative year after year from Major League Baseball to raise awareness of and a funding towards fighting breast cancer. And you'll see a similar thing on Father's Day for prostate cancer, two of the most important days on the Major League Baseball calendar every year. New pitcher for the Blue Jays is Anthony Bass. Anthony Bass hasn't pitched an awful lot lately. This is just his 14th appearance of the season, and he's had a rough start to his season. Drops a slider in there for a called strike to Travis Darno. Blue Jays have been encouraged by Bass's last couple of outings, which both came on the road trip. One was in Boston, one was in Pittsburgh, faced five batters, retired them all, struck out three between the two of them. Well, the interesting thing is there's a lot of baseball to be played yet. We've seen just about everything in this game home runs, airs, stolen bases, base hits. There's a little bit of everything, and we're in the fifth inning. So I think John Snyder knows you just got to hold the Braves down in check and give your offense a chance to get back in the lead. Line drive to left center, Merrifield over to make the catch. You know when he plays second he looks like a second baseman and when he plays left he looks like a left fielder he looks very comfortable in both. Yeah he was really shaded over in the alley and left center and that gave him a good jump on that ball It looked like it had a chance to split the outfitters but he cut into it and made a nice play of it. So now Marcelo Zuna who has doubled and flied out. And he went around 0 1. Five runs, nine hits, two errors for Atlanta, 4 8 and 1 for the Blue Jays. Kikuchi struck out seven, didn't yeah. walk a batter, but unfortunately gave up three home runs. You know what's funny about some of his outings this year, Buck? Sometimes 
the ones where he's had the bigger strikeout numbers are the ones where the harder contact has come. Right. The ones where he's not given up a lot of the contact or a lot of the, the hard contact. It's that one bounces off of Jansen and a wild pitch to Bass allows the runner to go to second. Like he's got swing and a miss and hard contact in the same game, but then when he keeps the ball in the park, he's not striking out as many guys. It's an odd combination. Sometimes. In Pittsburgh, he only yeah. had three strikeouts. Yeah. That breaking ball in the dirt came off the chest protector of Jansen and it allows Riley to move into scoring position. To right center field. Varsho has to go a long way to get it makes a good catch and a little pat on the back from his buddy George in right field well, Austin Riley he didn't get a very good read on that ball. he should have been able to tag up you can see that Varsho was going to get to it and once the base runner he's going to break he's going to look Varsho has got a beat on it right here and you can see he's going to catch it and Riley should have been able to tag up as deep as Varsho was when he made the catch. Riley gets in between and by the time he recognizes it it's much too late. Base running hasn't been on display on either team today. Two down and here's Kevin Pilar who homered his last time up. Obviously Andy Fletcher just heard something from the Blue Jay dugout about that ball one call. Pillard talked and a lot of players when they get to be Kevin's age talk about this. He talked yesterday down on the field about just understanding so much more now about how to take care of himself the importance of training and nutrition and sleep and et cetera et cetera. You know he said when you come up you're a young kid and you're just up there on enthusiasm and athleticism and you, you just go play. But as you get older you realize how many other things there are you have to do to be able to play. Yeah when you get to the big leagues as a youngster you think you're 10 foot tall and bulletproof and you can do everything. And there are times obviously there are times to crash into the wall and there are times to concede a base hit off the wall. Uh, Kevin Pilar I mean, he has no regrets he played it the right way. Unfortunately when he was with the Dodgers he had such a great season in Oklahoma City and finally got called up to the big leagues and then dislocates his shoulder yeah. sliding into third in like his fourth game or something yeah. and and the Dodgers were his uh, the team that he grew up loving yeah. right that was his team as a kid. He takes a walk here so it's first and second two down for Michael Harris. <laughs> That's what buds do. But I think you said it very well. Whenever the day comes that Kevin Pillar retires, he won't have a single regret. I, no. I think he'd look back and say, I gave it everything I had, and for as long as I was in the big leagues in terms of how I played the game. Well, and he learned that in college. He played at a Division II school in California. Dominguez Hills and his coach told him you guys are here because nobody else wanted you you've got to outplay everybody else and that was a message that Kevin Pilar carried with him the rest of his career. Five four Atlanta top of the fifth. Two on and two out. You know Kevin made some mistakes as a player remember when he was playing for John Gibbons and they pinch hit for him and he threw his bat down in the runway and Gibbons heard it sent him down right after the game and Kevin with his dad driving drove to Buffalo he said it was the longest ride of my career. He knew he had made a mistake and he paid the ultimate price got sent back to the minors. And came back a you much know, better shirt yeah. came back yeah, yeah different guy a couple of years later or less than a couple of years later. Remember all the Superman signs there used to be. <laughs> I saw a cape here today. Yeah. 
Remember they had a red tape on? So the runners will be going here with two down and a full count on Harris. And a swing and a miss. Bass gets him and strands a couple of runners. 5 4 Atlanta through four and a half. Let's get an update with Jamie Campbell. Roger Center on Friday night. It's May the 19th. The first 15,000 fans will receive a mesh hat presented by Ryobi. Go to bluejays.com slash tickets. That'll be the opening game of the series against the Baltimore Orioles, who are off to a very good start this season. Coming into play today, the Orioles 26 and 13. Three games ahead of the Blue Jays. They are trailing the Pirates four to nothing in the seventh inning today at Camden Yards. And yes, both Baltimore and Tampa Bay have played easier schedules that will even out, but they've both still won a lot of games. And as everybody knows, the American League East is crazy competitive this year. It's not going to be called the American League East the rest of the season. It's going to be the black and blue division because <laughs> everybody's beating up on everybody. Yeah. Boston is 22 and 18. They're in last place. Four games over 500. <laughs> 22 and 18 would put you in second place or tied for first in every other division. The worst you would be at 22 and 18 in any other division is second and it's last in the American League East. Boy Arcia did a nice job kind of turning his momentum there and getting a lot behind that throw. Yeah he sure did. He gathered himself and took an extra little hop to get his right foot on the ground solidly behind him and he got a lot on the throw. Watch how he comes around this baseball takes that extra stop and Boom throws a strike. A la Matt Chapman. <laughs> to get Matt Chapman. So one down and here's Whit Merrifield who has reached on an error. And has had a base hit and another stolen base. For people who may not know Whit Merrifield's got a long history of stealing bases. He has led the American League in steals three times all with Kansas City 2017 2018 2021. His season high is 45 back in 2018. But as a 34 year old to have a dozen right now and today kind of the unofficial one quarter mark of the season 40 games in so right about a quarter of the way through. You know, 12 out of 13 for a 34 year old that's good stuff. Yeah he's really good at picking his spots he understands the rhythm of a starting pitcher or a relief pitcher when he's on base. Or if he wasn't going to take that borderline pitch inside the previous one he thought was inside and it was called a strike. Jay Jackson is now up in the bullpen for the Blue Jays. To right field, and that is caught by Acuna, but he backpedaled, had to come in and reach down about knee high to make the catch. He has had a lot of adventures out there today. Yeah, he hasn't had a lot of fun playing in Rogers Center of these three games. He's had some interesting routes. You can see he backed up a little bit, and that ball kind of sunk on him. But he's able to make that catch. So two down here's Brandon Belt who has had an RBI single and has also been called out on strikes. Michael Tonkin up to 46 pitches out of the bullpen and the Atlanta pen is busy as well. Wow that's a, a missed call that benefits the Blue Jays right there that had a good chunk of the inside corner. And Bunt thinking of Belt rather thinking about Bunt for a base hit and he will. 
And this is something that when there was still shifting in baseball Brandon Belt did quite a lot a little bit trickier now without a shift but he saw enough daylight out there to give it a try. Boy, what a heads up play especially with two outs and you Bon, you can see the third baseman's not even in the picture because he's shaded Belt to pull and by the time Riley gets there his only chance is to make a barehanded play and he can't connect and Belt has his second hit of the game. Jansen with a fly ball to center. Harris is there, and that will retire the Blue Jays. We are through five, and it's still the Braves leading five to four. Steelers are facing elimination. It's Vegas and Edmonton. The Stanley Cup playoffs, 10 Eastern, 8 Mountain tonight on Sportsnet CBC and Sportsnet Now. They need all the dry sidle and McDavid they can get tonight. Here's the line today for Yusei Kikuchi. Four innings plus a batter. Didn't walk anybody, but did give up three home runs and charge with four earned runs. Yeah, not as sharp as he was, of course, last time out, but he kept the Blue Jays within striking distance. The hits are even at nine apiece, and now Jay Jackson will make his second appearance of the season. Jackson was. Uh, invite he into spring training and he's done a nice job working his way back to the big leagues. This spring he knew he was fighting for an opportunity with the new ball club and he pitched in eight games and threw the ball very well all spring long. Had a scoreless inning eight days ago when the Blue Jays were still in Pittsburgh and he gets this out and going against Orlando Arcia the number nine hitter in the Atlanta lineup. That's the slider that he throws a lot. That is, he throws it more than he throws his fastball. Yeah, he has pitched a lot and pitched all over the place. He is pitched in the big leagues. He's pitched in Japan. And he knows he's lucky to have the opportunity once again. Varsho's got room in deep center for the first out. Guy who at this point of his career says he just wants to be on a team that has a chance to win, feels the Blue Jays are that. And so even after he was released because he wasn't on the major league roster by a certain date late in the spring, he decided three days later to re-sign with the team. And at some point, Buck, in the next couple of weeks, some interesting decisions are coming. And as they say in the game, these things have a way of sorting themselves out. But you would imagine. At some point soon, Adam Simber, Mitch White, and Zach Pop are all going to get healthy. And there's just not room for everybody. Yeah, and you have to take them off their rehab assignments, and they have to be assigned to a team. And if you bring them back to the big league, somebody has to go here. You can keep a pitcher on a rehab assignment in the minors for up to 30 days. That clock has already started for White and Simber. White they are building up wanting to throw more and more pitches to use him whether it's as a sixth starter a little bit maybe spot him in at some point in this busy stretch or as a long man out of the bullpen Simbers clock started a little bit more recently he's made I believe just one rehab out of down at Dunedin and I don't think Zach Pop has pitched in a rehab game yet coming back from a hamstring injury. Three and two, the count on Ronald Acuna Jr. So it's Jay Jackson and Nate Pearson who came up to the big club when Adam Simber and then Zach Pop went on the IL. And that is ball four to Acuna. 
Let's go down to field level and Hazel May. When he got called up, Dan, he spoke to the media and said the love and respect and honesty that the Blue Jays had shown him is a big reason why he's here. He said, I wanted to be here just as much as they wanted me here. And I got to tell you, I'm glad I am. Dan. And they're happy to have him, too. A guy, and you could see it down in the spring, even though most of the guys had never met him before. He was another one of these guys that everybody just seemed to be drawn to and everybody was pulling for. When he came in and pitched that inning in Pittsburgh, as soon, I think it was the last inning of the game, I believe, but as soon yeah. as he closed out the game. Right, he closed out the game, and like as soon as the game was over, Matt Chapman was there giving him a hug, and they were all very excited for him. Runner bluffs a start, and a swing and a miss by Olsen. I don't think he was bluffing. I think he slipped a little bit. <laughs> Acuna broke as if he were going to jump, and then didn't like his jump and shut her down. But he's always a threat to run. Trevor Richards is up in the bullpen for the second time today and again it's Ozzie Albies on deck so uh, he'll be hitting from the left side no matter whether he faces Jackson or Richards but do they go to Richards because they like that change up against left handed batters Acuna draws a throw. Eric Young giving Acuna a little bit of advice. They haven't seen an awful lot of Jay Jackson, so neither one of the coach nor the runner are that familiar with him. Swing and a miss again. Two and two on Olsen. to shallow left field. And Merrifield is there for the second out. And it looks like John Schneider is staying put that he is going to leave Jackson in there to face Albies. And again this is a different situation than when Kikuchi was out there because no matter who's on the mound right now Albies is batting from the left side. Right and two you just want to find out what you have in Jay Jackson see how he handles this situation. Jansen looking for it but won't have a play and as we were talking about in the break you don't uh, certainly not on May the 14th you don't manage a game in a vacuum really because there's another game tomorrow. This is day three of 17 games in 17 days. The Yankees are here for four beginning tomorrow and you don't want to churn through too many pitchers if you don't have to. Now especially when you're looking forward to a four game series with one team because you know that you don't want to run those same relievers out there a couple of times in a series like to save as many arms and new looks as you can. Albies sends one to center and there's room again for Varsho. And that's that. No runs, no hits, a walk. Jay Jackson, another scoreless inning. And it's on to the bottom of the sixth. Fifteen thousand fans here next Saturday, May the 20th, will receive a Blue Jays pickleball paddle presented by Ryobi. For tickets, visit bluejays.com slash tickets. The first time I read that promo buck about 10 days ago, I got two texts within 30 seconds saying, can you get me one of those pickleball paddles? And it is young, a new and craze, people, yeah. yeah. It's a new craze. Yeah. It's uh, kind of an abbreviated doubles tennis match. Yeah. Jesse kind of like Chavez. Platform tennis. Platform tennis was this thing for a while, but it didn't Platform last tennis. Much. Yeah. Same kind of small court like right. that, but pickleball is good, especially among my age group. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe even Jesse Chavez. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's getting 39, close to that age right? Group. Yeah. <laughs> Young at heart, Jesse Chavez. Still pitching after all these years. 
Second day in a row, in fact. Through 12 pitches, were two thirds of an inning yesterday. And Santiago Espinal starts it off with a base hit. Espy's had a good game. He had a bunch of base hit and scored a run back in the second inning. Two seam fastball runs right into the bear of Espinal. Second multi hit game of the season for Espinal. There has still not been a three up, three down inning or half inning in this game. Here's George Springer, two for three, including a home run his last time up. They appeal, but no swing, so it's one and zero on Springer. Trying to keep everything away from these right handed power hitters like Springer. Man, Chavez knows who he is. He knows he's got to make good pitches and locate his pitches away. He's not going to throw anything over the inner half of the plate in these situations. He wants Springer to have to reach for it. I think this is where the Blue Jays have the advantage in this game is now that they're into the bullpen. Bullpen is not a real strength of Atlanta's. And Chavez takes a little bit off to get him as he strikes him out one down. Take on any project with home hardware. Proud partner of the Toronto Blue Jays. Here's how. Beautiful Sunday afternoon. The Blue Jays try to make a comeback and sweep the Atlanta Braves. Dan Schulman to Buck Martinez, Hazel May, and Bo Bichette. Bo is 0 for 2. He has struck out, walked, and reached on an error. That was charged to Matt Olson on the drop pop up. And then Bichette out 9 6 trying to advance. Pretty good hole on the right side with Espinall being held on by Olsen and all be shading up the middle. And a big swing and a miss, two and two. Again, everything is away, just the same way that Colin McHugh began this ball game, pitching all these right handed hitters away. Fastballs and breaking balls to the outside. Now, three and two. Mark Budzinski talking to Espinal. I'd start to run him. Go ahead, create some movement on the infield. It'd be the second baseman covering. Espinel's going. And it's fouled off by Bichette. Yeah, Albies was covering the second baseman. You can see him standing on the bag at second base right now, so that creates even a bigger hole for Bo Bichette to shoot one through the right side. Plus, this part of your lineup, you want to stay out of a double play and give Vladdy a chance to come to the plate. If, in fact, you hit into an out, you still have an opportunity to get Vladdy to the plate. Just did get back because he was going again. Yeah, he sure was. Yeah. And that's the lead you take over there where the coach says, make sure he goes home. <laughs> make sure he goes home. But you can see his momentum almost forced him into a step towards second. There he goes. And it's ball four to Bichette. 
So the Blue Jays have two men on with one out for Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Chavez faced just three batters in the outing yesterday afternoon. Norton Varsho tried to bunt. He was retired and he bunted it right to the first baseman. Then Chapman struck out against Chavez and Merrifield walked. Those were the only three batters he faced. Vladdy's one for three, had a line drive two run single into center field back in the second. So to strike one and one. You know, sometimes you watch it at bat and you think, boy, Vladdy looks a little bit jumpy, and then sometimes you say, he doesn't and he doesn't look jumpy right now like he looks like he kind of feels he knows what's coming and he can handle it. Yeah he's really seeing that ball well out of the pitcher's hand he can take that borderline pitch with a lot of confidence it's off the plate and Chavez is one of those make them come to you guys don't the stuff as you can see is not overwhelming at this point of his career but. Just he wants you to reach for those pitches four or five inches off the plate. Three and two. Kind of crossed him up a little bit, sort of to the inside part yeah. of the plate. Yeah, both strikes have been taken on the inner half because they're all looking out over the outside corner. about as upset as Guerrero will ever get and you can't blame him he wasn't fooled he took that because he knew it was off the corner but again it's been a wide strike zone all day long and you know Andy Fletcher will have a, Andy Fletcher will have a look at today after the game or tomorrow and he's I don't think he's going to like what he has seen too much because there have been a lot of pitches like this called strikes yeah man Vladdy had a good look at that pitch all throughout that at bat looked like it was off the plate. Get the head out, Dalton. Get that one into the second deck. Well, foul, but he was looking for something hard in the first pitch of the at bat. So two on with two outs now. Varsho is one for two with a walk. He's doubled, walked, and lined out. Good changeup. Very good changeup. Had Barsha way out in front, and that's a great read by Chavez. After Barsha pulled that ball so far foul, he came back with a much slower pitch. The Blue Jays three for nine today with runners in scoring position, and make it three for ten. He hit it right on the screws, but he hit it right at Albies, and they threaten, but they do not score here in the bottom of the sixth. Thousand fans of the Rogers Center will receive a Beau Bichette white replica jersey and a replica headband. For tickets, visit bluejays.com slash tickets. Lots of great giveaways, lots of big time home stands coming. <laughs> 5 4 Atlanta in front of a large, enthusiastic crowd here on Mother's Day. And the new pitcher is Trevor Richards. Fourth pitcher to work today for the Blue Jays and Richards numbers don't really reflect how well he's thrown the ball lately his changeup has been devastating and you see the strikeouts per nine innings nearly 15 strikeouts average over his nine innings of work and you'll have some tough hitters in Riley Dorno and Ozuna here in the seventh Riley's two for three got a couple of singles.
changeup in for a strike, and it's one and one. The Blue Jays used Jimmy Garcia, Eric Swanson, and Jordan Romano in yesterday's game. All of them threw at least 15 pitches. Romano, the fewest of those three, he got the save on 15 pitches. So they've got those three still out there, plus Tim Mays and Nate Pearson. And speaking of Tim Mesa, he's just getting up. Lefties hitting in the eight and two spots in the Atlanta lineup. Riley is the cleanup hitter, so. That first lefty, Michael Harris, the second, still a few spots away. Kirby Yates is up in the Atlanta pen. I think Tim Mays is up just to protect against Eddie Rosario coming off the bench. Rosario didn't start this game, and Kevin Pilar's spot in the seventh spot is coming up soon. So I think Rosario is the main concern for Snyder coming off the bench. Swing and a miss to get Riley. Enter the TD Grand Slam contest, and you could win the ultimate Blue Jays prize pack for four, including a meet and greet with George Springer. One run game, the Braves up 5 4 in the seventh. That's a great point you make, Buck, that if Rosario were to come off the bench for Pilar, that's one spot earlier. So Richards would still have faced three batters by then, which is enough. That's why it's great, and, and this applies for any team. But you got John Schneider, you got Pete Walker, you got Don Mattingly. You always probably have one guy who says, But what if you need a what if guy down Yeah, there, you right? always have to have a what <laughs> if guy, but yeah. what if they do this? Yeah. When I managed, I had Mark Connors, the pitching coach, and Cookie Rojas as the bench coach, and you know, I would ask them questions just like that. Well, what happens? Am I thinking right now? Is this what I'm thinking about? Do you think we should do that? It's always good. There's a base hit into center field for Travis Darno, his first hit of the ball game. Oftentimes you ask yourself questions you know the answers to, but you want to hear what the other guys right. think about. And is it a democracy? Like if the pitching coach and the bench coach both feel one way and the manager feels the other way, who the manager wins? still makes the decision? <laughs> yeah, you can get all the advice you want, but it's on the manager. Marcelo Zuna is one for three. I've never heard a manager say, well, a pitching coach wanted me to make a change. Uh, <laughs> they overruled me. <laughs> Manager's the one who's got to sit down in front of the microphones after the game. He's the only one that has a record, too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, for what it's worth, Kevin Pillar is in the on deck circle right now. The Mays has had plenty of time to get ready should they make the switch. P. Walker's got his hand on the phone. And Brian Snitker can see that Mays is throwing, so he knows that John Schneider's getting the lefty ready in case Rosario comes in to hit. I don't think he's coming in to hit. <laughs> I'm not trying, it doesn't. Yeah, I'll tell you, if he's coming in to hit, he is he's one laid relaxed. back guy. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I got this, Skip. Yeah. If you need me, I'm ready. Well, he's got a bat. I might not look ready, right. but I'm ready. Well, maybe he doesn't want to tip his hand. You know? <laughs> he's maybe doing he a good job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Richards felt like that was close enough to be called a strike. It's been a strike most of the afternoon.
They don't like hitting that changeup very much. Well, especially Azuna. He is a hard, hard hitter. He likes the ball hard, fastball slider. He's really on hard pitches, and that changeup gives him some problems. Bounced in another one, two and two. Hey, Danny Jansen's going to need a, a good ice bath at the end of the game today. He has been working hard back there. Been blocking pitches all day long. And a fastball to get him swinging, two down. Well, he did a good job of setting up this pitch, and he put it in a good spot up and away. You can see the two seam grip. He gets a little movement on it, and as soon as late, anticipating he might get that change up in, Richards crosses him up. So now it is indeed Pilar in his first action in the series. One for two with a walk, the one a home run back in the fourth. Strike. Since leaving Toronto, Pilar has played for the Giants, Red Sox, Rockies, I will admit to not remembering that one, Mets, briefly for the Dodgers, and now Atlanta. So this is his seventh team. Chapman. High throw over Guerrero. And that will extend the inning and allow Darno to come to third. Yeah, Matt went a long way to his left to field the ball. And how about this? His second error of the ball game, and that ball just gets away from him. You can see it's well over Vladdy's head up against the screen. He didn't have a play at second. With two outs, the runner got a good jump. It'll be another error on Chapman, his second error of the game. So first and third with two down for Michael Harris the second one for three at an RBI single back in the second. We talked about the first two games of this series and how they were such clean games played by the Blue Jays. This doesn't doesn't have that same look or feel. A little rough around the edges. Now back, and it's one and two. A swing and a miss. The tag applied by Jansen and Richards gets out of it. Seventh inning stretch here at Rogers Center. Dodgers, and you can check out that game on Sportsnet 360 and Sportsnet Now. Blue Jays have won the first two games of this series, as Buck mentioned. Those two much different kinds of games than today. This one's a little bit wilder. It feels like it's actually a higher scoring game than just five to four, but that's what it is right now. Bottom seven as the Blue Jays get a look at Kirby Yates for the second time in the series. Yeah, Kirby Yates came into the ball game and gave up the home run as he pitched in the opener on Friday night. He gave up a home run to Dalton Barshow in the eighth inning of that game. That was the third and final run of that ball game and a big insurance run for the Blue Jays. In that eighth inning appearance of Kirby Yates. And he'll face Matt Chapman, Whit Merrifield, and Brandon Bell. Chapman 0 for 3 at the plate. 
And two errors in the field. Just something you never see. First time he's made two errors in a ball game since May 15th last year. Almost exactly a year. Merrifield and Belt still to come. Blue Jays down a run. Hits even at 10 apiece. Errors even at two apiece. Left on base even at nine apiece. Yeah, neither manager is going to have a meeting and use this as an example. <laughs> this is how we play. <laughs> Both teams have been a little shaky. A fly ball to left center. Whoa, they come together and it drops again. What did I just say? A little shaky. <laughs> How about a lot shaky? Wow. Unbelievable. Major League Baseball, this certainly doesn't look like it. Brian Snitker, he is steaming. What's going on here? Center fielder has priority. There's no question about it. Kevin Pillar comes over and looks like he collides with Michael Harris the second. And boy, that's just. You can't have this happen in a major league game and it's happened a lot today. And at least for now Kevin Pillar has been charged with the error the left fielder. Either way Chapman is at second another gift for the Blue Jays. Whit Merrifield is up he's one for three. We used to have games like this once in a while and we would talk about Bingo Long and the traveling all stars. <laughs> Merrifield popped one into I'm trying to remember them all now right the second Albies went back Acuna came in they collided in the second Olsen dropped a pop up with Acuna right behind him in the fourth and now Harrison Pilar in the seventh. Yeah, for all you young fans out there, Google up Bingo Long and the Traveling All Stars. It was a great <laughs> baseball movie. <laughs> Line drive center field. And a diving catch. Chapman tagging. And he will come to third. Now that was some good base running. Absolutely a terrific read by Matt Chapman. He went back quickly responded thought he was going to see the ball caught and watch his reaction in second base. He looks goes back tags and then because Harris slides Chapman's able to move up 90 feet. What a terrific play by Matt Chapman. He goes right back and tags and then when the center fielder has to slide he can't make a good throw. So now the infield comes in for Atlanta with a tying run at third and one out for Brandon Bell. Out of boy, Chappie, out of boy. Yeah, that was maybe the cleanest sequence of the game. A good swing, a really good catch, and some equally good base running. Now can Brandon Belt deliver the tying run. A ball and two strikes. Nathan Lucas may be getting ready for some pinch running duty if Belt were to get aboard. That's the end of that bat.
Brandon Belts had a good day at the plate. RBI single, bunt base hit, two for three. Average climbing. Well, the Yates played a lot against each other in the National League. Yates in San Diego. Belt with San Francisco. It is just one for five against him. As Yates was the closer for the Padres and led the majors with 41 saves. The 2 2. And again upstairs, a full count. Good take right there. Danny Jansen next. This one back out of play. Now here's where Brandon Belt has to think about expanding his zone with the wide strike zone that Andy Fletcher's had all afternoon. You can't leave it in the hands of the umpire in this situation. This is popped up back of third. Garcia, the shortstop, takes charge and makes the catch for the second down. So there are two outs now, and it'll be up to Danny Jansen, who's one for three. Yates, as we mentioned, pitched on Friday night. He struck out Chapman and Kirk to end the outing after he gave up that solo home run to Dalton Barsho. The third baseman Austin Riley is playing way deep wanted to give himself more range to make a play so Matt Chapman can take a big lead and there you see him coming down the line. You never know when a ball just might bounce eight or ten feet away from the catcher. And a grounder right at Arcia. And the Blue Jays cannot tie the game. End of seven, it's the Braves five and the Blue Jays four as we get a Blue Jays central update now with Jamie and Joe. Join us on Sunday, May the 21st, a week from today. Take part in all the fun. Remember, new this year, parents, Junior Jays must register for a time slot to run the bases. Visit BlueJays.com slash tickets. It has become so popular, you need a reservation. Yes. <laughs> you got to have a reservation for Junior right. Jays Sunday. <laughs> nice long homestand. This game three of what? ten. With the Yankees in for four, then the Orioles for three, including a Junior Jays Sunday next weekend. Trevor Richards back out for his second inning on the mound. Orlando Arcia will lead it off. Trevor Richards has pitched more than an inning on five separate occasions this year. He's gone two full innings three times. And he has gone as high as 37 pitches in an outing. He is 20 at 28 right now. Line drive to center and right at Varsha. So I guess nearing 30 pitches not surprising that both Pearson and Mesa are up in the bullpen right now. Ronald Acuna Junior. Two for three including a leadoff home run.
little well, conversation in the dugout about the next move the Blue Jays might have to make. That's why they've got double barrel action in their bullpen. And down a run, you might be thinking about the bottom half of the inning as well. Espinal is going to lead it off. Right. If Pete's in on the conversation, then obviously it is about the pitching, but they're also possible pinch hitting, possible pinch running, as we saw last half inning. Well, the Braves aren't going to pitch hit for anybody until maybe they get down to Travis Darno in the fifth spot. Nobody else is going to be lifted for a pinch hitter. Guerrero in foul territory has room and he makes the play. And the dangerous Acuna is retired for the second out. These are some big outs that Trevor Richards is getting. Remember, he had to pitch around the air last inning as well. Here's Matt Olson now 0 for 4. It's huge for Richards to keep this a one run game. The Blue Jays top of the order is going to come up at least one more time. So give them an opportunity and keep it a one run game. That's a good change up. Great action on his delivery great action on the baseball and the velocity is about 10 or 11 mile an hour slower than his fastball and look how he throws that and just gets the great movement. Just foul. You got a pretty good changeup when you can throw it back to back because you're changing up on a changeup. And it's very effective. Nick Anderson is now up in the Atlanta pen. Guy who, before some injuries, had some great years for the Rays. See Albies next if Olsen gets aboard. And he will as he draws a two out walk. Still talking but no move they have sent Danny Jansen to the mound for a conversation with Richards but they will leave Richards in to face Albies. Forty pitches a season high for Trevor Richards. Yeah, he's the one guy that has taken that rule of a multi inning reliever down in that pen. Change up for a strike. A two run home run back in the third for Albies off Blue Jay starter Yusei Kikuchi. One of three home runs the Braves have hit today. Right now Trevor Richards can back up that last fastball with another fastball when Alves is probably sitting on changeup. Heads up. Came right back with the fastball. That was a good time to throw that pitch. Scoreless innings for Trevor Richards. The Blue Jays coming up down a run.
tonight. We get a four game series tomorrow night right here at the Rogers Center. You can get your tickets at bluejays.com slash tickets. That's not their plan. That's their not plane's bigger than plane's yeah, bigger that's than not that. the Yankees. Here are the probable pitchers. The Yankees have not announced a starter for tomorrow. It's Johnny Brito's spot, but they've got TBA listed. Domingo Herman, Garrett Cole, Nestor Cortez, and the Blue Jays just keep rolling the way they've been rolling. Uh, Manoa Gosman, Ambassador Barrios. The Blue Jays, one of the few teams, and the Yankees are actually one as of today that has only used five starting pitchers this season. Yeah, and the Yankees and the Blue Jays, they're kind of unique in that regard, and the Blue Jays have gotten a lot of innings from their starters, and the expectations are that the starting pitching is even going to improve from this point. New pitcher for the Braves, Nick Anderson, making his 16th appearance. And a guy who was just great for Tampa Bay for a couple of years and then ran into all kinds of elbow trouble. Had Tommy John surgery, then a follow up procedure. Basically, didn't pitch for two years. He's got a great curveball. He and Trevor Richards were traded together from Miami to Tampa Bay. That was back in July of 2019. And they really became an important part of that Rays bullpen, especially Anderson. Anderson had a terrific run in the postseason. Two balls and a strike on Santiago Espinal, who was two for three today. And a grounder to short for the first out. Top of the order now, George Springer, two for four, including his fifth home run of the season. The game's actually calmed down. It was <laughs> it was five four at the end of four innings. I mean, there's still been a little bit of weird stuff here and there, but neither team has scored since the fourth inning. Sends it to right, but it is playable out there for Acuna. Two down. As we mentioned, the Yankees are coming and we'll have the broadcast for you. Today, Alec Manoa, bobblehead day. Tomorrow night, the real thing as he is on the mound to begin a series against the Yankees. But the Yankees and Rays, they have had some series in New York, and currently the Rays lead the Yankees 8 7 as they go to the ninth inning. It's a four game series there and there too. The Yankees have taken two of the first three. Bo Bichette hits it hard but right at Arcia and Nick Anderson retires the Blue Jays in order in the bottom of the eighth. The Kraken and the Stars the winner moving on to the Western Conference final. You can catch it tomorrow at 8 Eastern 5 Pacific on Sportsnet and Sportsnet now. Top nine, it's 5 4 Braves, and out of the Blue Jay bullpen comes Nate Pearson. Well, his sixth appearance since coming up from Triple A Buffalo, and Nate is now working exclusively out of the bullpen and try to keep this a one run game here as he works to the middle of the order. Austin Riley will lead it off for Atlanta. Riley two for four, couple of base hits. Travis Darno on deck, Marcelo Zuna behind him. Did not go. Lays off again. Yeah. 
Pearson shakes off Jansen once, then nods in agreement with the second side. He wanted the fastball, but he missed low ball three. Just low to walk him. Danny Jansen talking to Andy Fletcher about the strike zone right now. Darno is one for four, had a base hit his last time up. Up on the infield for Bichette. One down. Rizel Iglesias is now up in the Atlanta pen. He is their closer. Marcelo Zuna, the batter now. Slider misses outside, ball one. This is the sixth appearance of the season for the Blue Jays for Nate Pearson. Another pop up. Guerrero is there. Two down. That might have been a little bit trickier than maybe it looked on TV from the way that Vladdy was. Yeah, he's talking to Espinal about it right now. It's a, it's a bit of a hazy day now up there. Yeah, there's a lot of glare up there, and you can see that kind of haze up above Rogers Center, and he was looking right into the sun. I tell you what, on this afternoon, take nothing for granted. <laughs> yeah. Kevin Pilar, one more time. One for three, homered back in the fourth. Out in front, 0 and 2. But he missed just down and away. And he got him. A good inning for Nate Pearson. The Blue Jays coming up at the bottom of the ninth, down a run. Vladdy is going to lead it off. Dalton Varsho behind him committed in this game it's had it's uh, weird and wacky at times today Buck boy it sure has Dan the only thing that was missing were the dancing bears <laughs> the Braves had a terrible time in the outfit Matt Chapman makes two errors in the same game for the first time in over a year Bo Michette makes a base on a mistake and here's the second error for Chapman he air mails out but Pilar runs into Harris for an air and I'll tell you what, there was a lot of funny things going on, but it has settled down here lately. Neither club has scored since the fourth inning. And Bryce Hell Iglesias, you can see just his fourth appearance of the season, he wasn't activated until May 5th. He had shoulder issues. He's a good one when he's healthy, but he hasn't really had enough innings to have his full complement of confidence just yet. Vladdy go hit a dinger on Mother's Day. Vladdy is still looking for his first home run of the year at home here at the Rogers Center. He did deliver a big two run single earlier today. 
Dalton Varsho hit his first home run at Rogers Center on Friday night. So this would be a timely home run in a couple of different ways. A couple of powerful bats back to back here to start the bottom of the ninth with the Blue Jays down by a run. The Braves have been swept in a series once already this year. They have lost the first road series of the season with this series. Last year, all season long, they weren't swept in a series. Big crowd, big ovation for Vladdy as he steps in. Iglesias with 158 career saves. Chalked up a lot of those with the Reds and the Angels. Play by the ball boy down there. I tell you what, it's surprising, but Glacius has never faced Guerrero nor Varsho. They're both seeing him for the first time. Ripped foul into the netting down the line. Fastball slider changeup, that's what you'll get from Iglesias. This fastball will average about 95 miles an hour. Got him in a deal with the Angels last year. Pitched very well down the stretch for them. To right field. It's well hit. It is off the wall. And Vladdy's only at first base. Wow. You know, we've seen this all afternoon from both teams where you play the game anticipating something's going to happen and you'll get burned. Vladdy thinks he hit it out of the ballpark, so he doesn't leave the batter's box. And then when it bounces off the wall, he is stuck at first. Watch this. He thinks it's gone, just jogging up the first baseline, and then he thinks about it, and at least he didn't try to stretch it into two. I don't know if he could have advanced had he hustled because Acuna was playing it pretty well off the wall. But boy, oh boy, you just can't come out of the box like that when you're down by a run. Now Varsho's popped it up on the infield. And Olsen will make the catch. And he knows he made a mistake. But when they when they make mistakes, you know, John Schneider will get asked about it and he'll say, that's not who we want this team to be. That's not what we preached all spring training down in Dunedin. And unfortunately, they have had a, a few slip ups on the bases today. Here's Chapman. So the tying run at first with one out in the bottom of the ninth. Chapman representing the winning run. Inside ball two. Pretty good tank right there, borderline pitch. And you can see Glacius velocity just 92. His normal fastball will be about 95. As we mentioned, this is only his fourth appearance in the big leagues this season. Three and one. Just in case, Giermeyer loosening up those legs. And Chapman aboard. So that'll push Guerrero to second. Two on with one out for Whit Merrifield. Well, 
what's going on now Fletcher yeah. looks like he has called something. They're calling that a disengagement they're calling that. Yeah. That's what that signal was exactly. from the umpire. If it's not clear the clock can just run out and it's ball one. And Merrifield swinging at the first pitch lifts one to left center. Pilar is in and he'll make the catch. Two down. Well, Merrifield, he got a pretty good pitch to hit on that first pitch and just got underneath it. So at least at the moment it comes down to this. First and second, two down, and Brandon Belt is the batter. Two for four on the afternoon. As you can see from that stat right there, the Blue Jays have had their chances. Three for 15 with runners in scoring position today. They've already stranded 10. Bouncer to the left side, not hit hard. No play anywhere. And the bases are loaded. Is yeah. going to run for Belt. And yeah, like he's not the winning run. That's at second, tying runs at third. But this is if there's a ground ball hit and the only play is to second base, Lucas has a better chance of making the infielder have to throw somewhere else rather than Belt. Right, and that's exactly right. So Belt's had a three hit game, and now it's up to Danny Jansen. And it's noisy here, folks. Fastball for a strike. Again, Riley very deep at third. So now Guerrero, who is the runner at third, he can get a big lead in case a pitch bounces away. Ooh. That was almost the one. Ooh. Way off the plate inside. Jansen gets out of the way. And I know secures it in his catcher's mitt. Guerrero the tying run at third. Chapman the winning run at second. But there are two outs. Two and one. Swing and a base hit. Guerrero in to score. Chapman on his way home, and the Blue Jays win it. have just swept the Atlanta Braves. Boy, what an important win for the Blue Jays. They had made mistakes all afternoon. They couldn't take advantage of multiple base runners, but Chapman slides in with the game winner. And Danny Jansen, who's had a rough start to his season, comes up with a big hit to complete the sweep of the Atlanta Braves. Pulls it to the left side of the infield, and Chapman, with good space, going to score ahead of the throw, and the celebration begins. What a, what ball, a, game. What what a ball, ball game. What a series. What a way to end it. Danny Jansen with a two run single through the left side to score Guerrero and Chapman as the Blue Jays score twice in the ninth to walk it off and sweep a very good team in Atlanta. And as you can see, 
Jano, as they call him, is on his way for a chat with Hazel. Danny Jansen is your Mother's Day hero this afternoon. What an at-bat for you, Danny. Base is loaded and a chance to tie, end, or win this ball game. What are you telling yourself in this situation? Yeah, I'm just trying to stay calm, try to get a pitch to drive, and, and uh, you know, put a good swing on it. So You've always told me your priority is calling a ball game and working with your pitchers. It's been a tough go for you at the plate. What did this one mean for you to actually win it and sweep the Atlanta Braves? But hang on, Vladdy has something to tell you. This ball club just swept the NL East leading Atlanta Braves three straight games. And it doesn't get easier from here. You've got the New York Yankees at your doorstep for a four-game series. What do you hope you and your teammates can carry over from this series to the one beginning tomorrow? Yeah, just momentum, you know, and uh, you know, we got the best fans in the world. So I know we're... I know we're going to bring it, so uh, it's exciting. We're excited. I can't let you go. I know you have a Mother's Day message for your beautiful wife and your mom watching you. What would you like to tell them? Yeah, well, thank you guys for the people you are, for the mothers you are. It's already a special day and, and it capped it off in a special way. So, Thanks to you, Danny Jansen. Congratulations. We'll see you tomorrow. Danny Jansen and the Blue Jays have just swept the Atlanta Braves, guys. What a way to end it. A special series, a sweep of the Atlanta Braves, and moms everywhere <laughs> rejoicing here at Rogers Center. Let's go to the Budweiser studio now with Jamie and Joe.